1989, I threw a New Year's Eve party and nobody came. I know it sounds like the start of a Taylor Swift song, so Taylor, if you're, <laughs> call me. But actually it was kind of sad because I asked my parents to buy, you know, the good soda, not the generic Coca-Cola, and the good chips, and I ended up spending the night all alone with my little sister, which, as you know, is what every teenage boy loves to do on New Year's Eve. And it occurred to me that it was a shame that I wasn't making friends because it's so much easier to make friends when you're younger, right? The whole world is structured to help you make friends. Your parents and teachers push you. The school is structured to help you make friends. And in fact, research says that the majority of the friends that we make, real friends, we make before the age of 25. So it's extra confusing that nobody ever teaches you how to make friends. Making friends and keeping them is a skill. It's a super important skill, right? We teach people to drive, we teach people to do math, and we don't teach you how to access this superpower that enables all these great benefits for you as a human, right? Jobs, money, care, love. But I'm pleased to say I put the work in. I still now, as I slide into my 50s, <clears throat> love making new friends. And many of the friends that I made back in high school made the cut, and they're still with me today. What's not still with me today is this beautiful mullet. That's actually a picture of me. Yes, I did have hair, proof of life. Okay. Whether you have hair or not, though, the situation is very different now. In fact, 15% of men report that they have no close friends. And that number doubles for men under 30. This is a phenomenon that has accelerated dramatically in the last generation. It's up 500% in the last generation. And Gen Z says that they are the loneliest generation ever to exist, with three quarters of them saying that they frequently feel lonely. It's such a problem that it's been declared a health epidemic by the US Surgeon General and the WHO, the latter of which says that one in four humans feels lonely and isolated regularly, and that the health impact of that isolation, if you can believe this, is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day as far as its impact on your life expectancy. Can you imagine we've put so much work into getting people to not smoke anymore, and loneliness causes the same thing? Now, at the same time that we've got this phenomenon of our friendship circles declining, we have this extreme polarization occurring in our societies, and our friendship groups are becoming more homogenous. In fact, 80% of us will marry somebody from the same religious and political background as we have now, and 85% of Americans already live in a zip code extremely segregated by religious and political views today. It's extra confounding because everything we've done as a society in the industrialized world should suggest that instead of having less friends who are less diverse, we should have more friends who are more diverse in thought. Because since the end of the Second World War, the population in the industrialized world has doubled. The number of people with a university degree it's up sevenfold. And social technology that connects us together is absolutely everywhere. And I'm not just talking about Instagram and WhatsApp, I mean the telephone and literacy, right? Everything that enables us to connect is right in front of our faces. And the most jarring one to me is the effect of diversity in the population. Because since that time, in 1945, the US, for example, was 90% white. And in 2045, the US will be minority white. And so all of these things put together, growth in population, university education, social tech, diversity of population, all should suggest a different outcome than a world that is increasingly lonely and increasingly polarized. And so it causes us, it makes us ask, we have to ask some really serious questions. And the most serious among them is, has our approach to diversity actually been the cause of this isolation and polarization rather than the cure to it? And I don't think we're going to get to a clear answer today. We need a lot of research to get to an answer. But social scientists are starting to ask this question in different ways. And one of the most interesting bits of research comes from Angela Bonds at Wellesley College in the United States. Professor Bonds looked at the attitudes of students in college towards diversity. And you're going to need to stay seated while I tell you the results of this research. The more students valued diversity, of race, of gender, and of sexual orientation, the less they were tolerant of diverse opinions. 
right? It's shocking, it's shocking, but it's not surprising. If you follow the news, none of that was surprising. It's upsetting, but not surprising. And here's the kicker. The bigger the population, the larger the population from which you could choose your friends, the less tolerant people became, okay? So this is a very, very serious problem. We all know it's a serious problem. We have to work on it. We're all feeling it. We know we got to do something. We've got some time, right, to solve this problem. Well, actually, my friends, the chickens are already coming home to roost. And where the problem has appeared already is in our workplaces, which are the last great diverse location that people come together, right? If we've got segmented, segregated kind of high schools, families, and then even in university by thought, the workplace is the last spot where people have to come together and be able to work. Now, I work with lots of companies to help them create more dynamic and engaged uh, cultures and employee environments. And the CEOs that I work with are literally freaking out about this issue because we're starting to see very private conflicts between people who cannot communicate erupt into the public sphere. And by the way, that's exactly what Dr. Bonds predicted in the monograph of her research, where she theorized that the big problem would be people working together in diverse work groups. And so now, the private is starting to become public, and there's no more prolific example of that than Bud Light, okay? Recently, so Bud Light was the number one selling beer in the United States. That's a little bit of foreshadowing for you. It's a mass market beer, it's closely associated with sports like NASCAR, and you know, football and, and baseball and basketball. And recently, Bud Light did a promotion with a trans influencer named Dylan Mulvaney. And Mulvaney themselves is not an athlete or a particular sports fan, but they did this promo, and the conservative world went nuts. They organized a giant boycott against the brand, just to give you some stats. Bud Light sales went down more than 25%. The parent company's stock price has declined by double digits. Many people have been fired, and to close the loop, Bud Light is no longer the number one beer in the United States. Now, I personally have no problem with Bud spending all year doing trans promotions, okay? But I'm not a Bud Light drinker. And there's no question that this was a misstep in terms of the culture. So what do we see here? What, is, what happened in this Bud Light case study? It is the corporate culture of Anheuser-Busch InBev coming into conflict with the culture of the consumer of the product, okay? When you dig under the covers, when you look at what actually happened inside the company, the corporate culture at, at Anheuser-Busch doesn't respect trans rights, but doesn't allow people to push back on pro-trans initiatives. So that's transphobic inside the culture of, of the company. And so once that butts up against the kind of public reality, you see the conflict. The people who would have derailed this or stopped this from happening couldn't actually speak and be able to do that. And so you have a lack of communication that's leading to some bad decisions. Increasingly, corporate cultures are coming under public scrutiny, and external stakeholders of all kinds do not like what they see. And so many CEOs, including the ones that I work with, are actively dismantling their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. They're pulling back from them, and they're pulling back from social causes because they're like, it's too hot to handle, we can't do this, this isn't working, we have a problem. And you're right, there's a problem. We need to reform the way that DEI works in the corporate environment for sure. But DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, is itself not the problem. The problem is a culture that's not able to take the benefits of diversity, the, take the fruit that's planted in the form of a diverse, inclusive culture, and get the really delicious juice out of it. And the reason it's not able to do that is because friends are not allowed in the workplace. And in some cultures, right, friends, friendship and work are supposed to stay totally separate. But as a general rule, friendship is not allowed in most work cultures. And this prevents us from being able to get the benefit. Now, friendship at work has lots of other benefits other than making people better at difficult decisions. Did you know that if you've got a work bestie or a work wife or a work husband, that you are 700% more productive that's a real stat. It's a crazy stat. It means nobody's working, by the way. The rest of us are clearly not working. Um, but, also, but also in practical terms, it means that you're more likely to uh, put in extra work. You're less likely to quit. You're more likely to refer people to the company. And really importantly to the CEOs that I work with now, you are much, 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 much more likely to want to come into the office and work in person. 
So friendship at work has all these benefits. The research says it's got all these benefits. Why don't companies embrace more friendship at work? Well, it's about control, baby, okay? For as long as I can remember, when I went to business school, we were taught friendships in the office, bad, bad. They undermine control. Friends will conspire. They will steal money, right? There will be an aspect of favor, steal money was a big one, right? There, <laughs> they'll, they'll, there'll be an aspect of favoritism, right? Which is bad because it's a meritocracy. Not like everybody doesn't know that people have friends at work, right? And they favor each other. So for all of these reasons, companies have chosen literally any corporate cultural value, anything they can get their hands on other than friendship. And my favorite one is the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars and countless hours that we've spent building teams inside companies. Okay? How is a team supposed to work without some strong bonds between some of the people inside of the team? It doesn't work. It's not a viable idea. And any of us who've worked in a small group environment, you've done a startup, you know how strong some of those friendships that you build can be. They are really strong bonds. So you can't build a team from top down. A team needs to be built from the bottom up. So the whole thing is just sort of crazy. So I've started working on this thing with people, with companies, that I call being friend forward, okay? So what does this mean? This means a reimagining of the corporate culture with four kind of sort of simple ideas for how to make that happen. The first one, very simply, is money and time, okay? If you have money and time as a company to encourage your teams to go out bowling, you can allocate that same amount of money and time when a group of friends wants to go out bowling, okay? It's not necessary to only do it for teams. You, can, you have to be open about it. The culture has to be open about the friendships that exist. And things like mentoring should have a dynamic where people are, if not encouraged, at least allowed to be friends with people that they mentor. We need to actually upskill. We need to teach people how to be friends because aforementioned, many people are having trouble with those skill sets, but luckily there are ways. And we need to provide support because here's the one thing that's really different in a friend forward organization. People disagree about stuff because friends disagree about stuff. And what friends do is they work through their disagreements if they want to stay friends. And so we have to provide support. We can't be avoidant of conflict. And we're not going to be able to be avoidant of conflict because the world is full of conflict. And our companies reflect that. Now, at the same time that the companies get the benefit of being friend forward, we as society can get the benefit of using our workplace as a place to develop adult friends. I've pulled together lots of the research on adult friendships, happy to talk about it at some point, and kind of created this mnemonic that I call CABS, okay? And that is the things that are necessary for an adult friendship to thrive. Care and communication, abundance, balance, and most importantly, showing up. Now, I'm sure you can think of, I know that I can, a friend who's drifted out of your life for no particular reason, other than time, work, school, kids. You didn't have a fight with them. You still like this person. You think of them fondly. They're just not close to you anymore. Well, showing up is the single biggest factor that determines whether an adult friendship works. Surprise, surprise. And what is work but a place where you have to show up semi-regularly? <laughs> it's literally the perfect environment to have friends as an adult. What's not perfect is this idea that somehow we've learned from Tinder and pop psychology that everything needs to have perfect alignment. That if we don't have a perfect values alignment with somebody, we should swipe left on them. Cut them out of your life, girl. They're toxic, okay? <laughs> the same thing cannot also is true of your relationship with a company. It's not going to be possible going forward for companies to be the social advocates that they have been in the past and in that context, you're not going to be able to have a perfect values match with your employer. So the reality is we've got to unlearn this. And again, we unlearn this by being friend forward. My favorite example of friends with values mismatches, let's say, is the friendship of U.S. Supreme Court justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. Okay? If you don't know their, their work, let me summarize their viewpoints for you for a second. RBG, a tireless advocate for women's rights, in her kind of worldview, for example, every woman should be able to have an abortion if they want one. And Scalia, no woman should ever be able to have an abortion under any circumstances, period, end of story. And I think that's actually a quote. Um, so they're, they're very, very different people, you know, in terms of their views. And yet, 
They were, by all accounts, best friends. They went to the opera together regularly. They traveled the world together regularly. But listen to this. Every time the news would report on it, they were described as the unlikely friendship of Scalia and Ginsburg. And every time they were questioned about it, you can Google it, every time they were questioned about it, it was like people accused them of being traitors. How can you be friends with somebody who's, who's a traitor because they view it through a different lens? This is central to our problem. The idea that this kind of friendship doesn't work is central to the mental problem we have with making and keeping friends going forward. And you know what? They made it work. And they did a lot of work as a result of it. And they understood that a friendship, even of difference, with difference of opinion, can transcend. And so perhaps I sound a bit Pollyannish, right? I sound very optimistic about everything. And I've stood up here for the last few minutes and told you that if we can all just get along, if we can all be friends, <laughs> everything will magically fix itself. Isolation, polarization, friends just solve all those problems, right? But I'm not saying that, actually. I'm saying it's not going to be easy, in fact, to do many of the things that we're doing. But I want to encourage us all to channel what I call our BPE, okay? Our BPE. That's our big playground energy. <laughs> think back, think, think back. There was a time when our worlds were structured to make friendships easier to make, easier to maintain. Everybody wanted us to be friends. The system was structured so we could be friends. It gave us time and money to be friends with each other. It drove us to play dates, okay? This can happen again. A friend-forward organization is the perfect platform on which to create this connection, both for the benefit of business, for creating a better work environment, one that is more cohesive, one that is more intelligent, one that is more connected, one that's more enjoyable because it's full of your friends. But also, because the workplace is the last great spot in the world where diverse people are forced to work together, it is an opportunity for us to combat these social structures that are limiting our ability to connect with each other in meaningful ways. And so I always think to myself when I, when I contemplate this, I believe, I know in my heart, and I know from experience, real friends, true friends, friends who are willing to go the distance, friends who are willing to show up, put in the care, and take you to task, friends who are willing to disagree about stuff and come to a resolution, can change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.